Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Cyborg Series. And for those of you from the SENS community, welcome back to um, the Spring SENS programming. Um, so just, I'm gonna give a brief intro on Cyborg um, for those of you who are unaware of what we do. Um, and welcome back to those of you who are coming from previous sessions in Cyborg. And then I'll introduce our guests and then we'll, we'll get rolling on the conversation. Uh, so the Cyborg series is intended to create a forum for graduate students to consider the difficulties of interdisciplinary research and hopefully think about ways to overcome them. Um, it was created by Arno uh, Zimmern, Christian Karsten and I, uh, motivated by our own experiences of the difficulties of interdisciplinary research and a desire to create that community um, around ourselves and to reach out to other graduate students uh, to create a sort of support group um, for uh, students doing this kind of work at Notre Dame. So the series is focused on the process of research rather than end products to try and pull back the curtain on how to navigate the everyday challenges of producing work across the disciplines. And we wanna consider challenges like those of communication, institutional support and facilitation and practical training that scholars might face in their interdisciplinary research proce uh, process. Um, so first of all, thanks to SENS for co-hosting this. Um, and I see a few SENS people here in the audience, so that's awesome. Um, and also thanks to our sponsors for Cyborg, um, the Graduate Students' Union, the Grad Life Grants Program and the Navarre Center for Digital Scholarship. So the session, first half of the session will last about 45 minutes where we'll do um, a conversation between Professor Solomonescu and Professor O. Young, and then we'll move to 45 minutes Q and A. If you have questions while the conversation is going on in the first half of the session, you can pop them in the chat and uh, myself or Arno um, or Kristen when she gets here, Kristen is currently defending her dissertation prospectus. Um, so she'll be here in about 10 minutes or 15 minutes, um, but we will moderate the chat and we'll keep an eye on the chat box if you wanna pop questions in there. But alternatively, you can just wait until we move to the Q&A portion and you can put up a digital hand or a physical hand and we'll keep an eye and we'll get to you. Uh, so just to introduce our guests, well, our one guest and uh, Yasmin, who's not technically a guest, I suppose. Um, so Professor O'Young is an associate professor of English and an affiliate faculty uh, of the Center for Cognitive Studies at the University of Minnesota. Her first book was called When Fiction Feels Real, Representation and the Reading Mind. It provides literary studies with a new cross-disciplinary method for examining the relationship between novelistic technique and literary experience, focusing on how realist writers from Jane Austen to Thomas Hardy bring readers into intimate relation with fictional persons and worlds. Her current book project is called Unselfing, What We Can Ask of the Arts, and it accounts for how the arts, including fiction, poetry, painting, music, and dance, create uniquely powerful but fragile experiences of absorption, intimacy, belonging, and even transcendence. And our interlocutor, Professor Salomonescu, who most of you know, I think, um, is an associate professor here of English at Notre Dame. Uh, her research focuses on British Romanticism with a particular interest in persuasion and rhetoric, cognition, epistemology, and literary theory. Professor Salomonescu's first book, John Thelwall and the Materialist Imagination, advances the critical recovery of the reformer and polymath John Thelwall and shows to what extent romanticism's belief in the imagination as an agent of social and cognitive change was bound up with the developing sciences of body and mind. Her current book project is entitled Romantic Persuasions and considers how romantic writers fundamentally reconceived of the theory and practice of persuasion. So um, I will hand it over to Professor Solomonescu and a final welcome to Professor O'Young. We're really excited to have her here and a thank you to Professor Solomonescu for joining this series. Um, and it's over to you, Yasmin. Right, thank you so much. I would just like to start by briefly thanking the organizers, um, especially as this is the last event of the semester. So thanks to Claudia, Car Carol, Kristen Carlson, and Arno Zimmern. Um, I have huge admiration, I don't think I've told them this, but for their initiative in creating a venue for such discussion about the potentialities and the pitfalls maybe of collaborations or at least conversations between the humanities and STEM subjects. And they, from what I've, the glimpse I've had behind the scenes, they've invested tremendous energy in this and in the associated reading group. And in these unprecedented circumstances, that's um, not to be taken lightly. So um, great admiration and applause to them. I'm pleased to serve as the conduit for their questions, not least because it gives me the opportunity to engage today with our guest, Professor Elaine O'Young. And I'm meeting her in person for the first time, well, in person, virtually, <laughs> for live for the first time, but with the benefit of reading her 2018 book, When Fiction Feels Real. And since the premise of the book is that literature draws on our existing cognitive resources and capacities and processes for comprehending the world on a day-to-day -day basis, so as to make its characters seem remarkably vivid and lifelike, 
I think I can acknowledge that I feel I have a rather vivid sense of her already. And certainly her own prose um, is so strong that one really does have a sense of vividness um, and lifelikeness. Um, the book also acknowledges though that books and real people aren't the same or knowable in the same ways. And that means that um, autobiography of an intellectual sort is a good starting point for us. So the first question that I'm putting to you on behalf of the organizers and certainly the audience um, concerns your own journey and trajectory. Um, so what drew you to interdisciplinary work and to cognitive science or sciences in particular? And what do you think the latter affords literary critics? Um, is your current work and your, your future work or the book and, and the next book, are they similarly interdisciplinary? And is there anything you could tell us about your personal approach to interdisciplinarity, may, maybe a philosophy guiding how you approach it, how you interact with other scholars, um, how you understand your goals? So anything about your inter intellectual autobiography would be appreciated. Sure, thank you, uh, Yasmin. And just a quick thank you to everyone for being here at the all end of semester events are hard to attend because uh, it's very been a very exhausting semester. So I appreciate um, you coming today. And um, thank you, Yasmin, for being my interlocutor and Claudia and Arnaud and all the organizers for creating this really unique um, and incredible resource in this, like making the most of the resources that you have and creating something that I certainly would have really benefited from as a graduate student. So just thank you all. Um, so as for my interests, I've been actually committed to the same questions for a surprisingly long time. So I became obsessed with Jane Austen in middle school and uh, would beg my mom to take me to the public library so that I could check out books about the Regency period. Um, then fast forward to my junior year in college, I was thinking about what to write for my senior thesis on, obviously Jane Austen. Um, and I was looking at all these monographs on like in the Austen section of the library. And of course there's monographs on every possible topic and Jane Austen that you can think of, but none of them explained to me why I felt so intimately connected to the novels and to Austen in the first place, or why why am I so motivated to write on her? Um, and at that time I turned to reader response theory, especially the theories of Wolfgang Wolf Iser, um, but they, this didn't really have the, quite the answers to my questions, partly because phenomenology as a philosophic method is, is not especially precise when it comes to focusing on reading as a specific mental activity. It's kind of interested in all of consciousness <laughs> and uh, reading is actually a very specific set of activities. Um, and so in general, I was frustrated that literary studies was much more focused on interpretation than accounting for literary experience. And so an, an available move that was, uh, that came to me often was just looking at literary representations of reading or aesthetic response, but we didn't have any conceptual tools for unpacking the actual mental processes. And this was kind of a black box. And at the same time, um, something that's become really clear to me is that literary experience itself is really routinely dismissed as a naive uh, reading practice, the mark of an amateur, but it has importance for a lot of readers, a lot of our undergraduates, um, a lot of creative writers. So often in my work, I will cite writers like Proust or George Eliot or the Brontes or Dickens or um, now Marilyn Robinson or Claudia Rankin have said things about literary experience um, that say like, this is actually really happening <laughs> to a lot of people. Um, and so there's a kind of politics to my approach in that I'm trying to do justice to a dimension of our engagement with literature that has been dismissed by the discipline. And this has been dismissed 
because of how the discipline came to define itself and who was doing the defining. Um, and so my position is instead of disciplining ourselves out of this dis dimension of literary experience, can the discipline be expanded to include it and to take it seriously? And if we think about graduate training um, now, we're still all reading Saussure um, and interpretations of his linguistic theory, but that's a hundred years old. So it doesn't seem like too much to ask to update our understanding of, you know, what are people thinking about what happens when we read and language and responding to social information or learning. And so psychology really has a lot to offer literary studies, even if you're coming from a very literary place, which I am, and I'm interested in questions of representation and technique and the mediatedness of literature and the arts. Um, and so my new project, uh, Unselfing, uses some social, social psychology to think about aesthetic experience more broadly um, in these other domains like music and dance and visual art, theater, poetry. And I'm especially interested in when audiences are allowed to occupy a role in which they can attend to others, but not be subject to attention themselves. And so this is in like the last chapter of my book. Um, and this allows them to also disattend to their own concerns. So you don't have to think about yourself um, in a lot of these aesthetic situations. And so these are very specific relational and situational or social contexts that allow you temporarily to be absorbed in something else, to feel like you belong, to connect, to have intimacy, um, but then my ethical question is, what happens when we're not in these contexts? Because we often just assume that, oh, we're trained, we feel empathy when we're at the theater, when we're reading, and then this will train us to be empathetic in our actual lives. But actually, those are very different social situations, and we're very sensitive to those differences. So how can we bridge this gap, or what would we need to think about if we wanted to reflect on acting on behalf of others when the conditions that facilitate our empathy and solidarity are absent. Um, so that's my current project. And then I have a little bit of a side project that I've been thinking about, which is something that's on everyone's mind, which is the rationale for literary study and John Guillory has um, an essay from 2002 that's still really relevant, which is called the very, On the Very Idea of Pedagogy. And he talks about how when literary critics talk about the teaching of literature, we kind, there's a kind of conceptual thinness to it, just like our conceptual thinness when we talk about literary experience. Um, and this is partly because teaching has had low status in the discipline. It's a hands-on practice as opposed to this professional theory. Um, and the teaching core is very feminized or associated with women. So it also has had low status historically. Um, so that we don't, we haven't really worked out the relationship between our theoretical assumptions and how students learn but now in education schools, we know a lot about how people learn. Uh, so their perspectives can really help us clarify what we actually are doing in our scholarship, our scholarly interventions and in the classroom and help us think about how to be more effective. Thank you so much. That's um, such, a, such a rich and timely set of concerns. Um, the, um, it, it really leads into the next question, which is what you understand as the, I guess we would now say affordances of the different methodologies and, and what you bring together from your um, reading in the cognitive sciences, maybe conversations with your um, training in English. Um, so where do you think the goals might converge or overlap um, and maybe where not. Um, what have you learned about the humanities in terms of the academic culture, the pedagogical um, um, 
priorities or, or understandings, the methodological assumptions, the research values from your work from the other perspective in, in STEM or in cognitive studies and vice versa. Um, what, what basically do you see as the strengths and weaknesses of each um, discipline, if we want to call these massive conglomerations disciplines um, or set of fields? And how do you try to capitalize on the strengths and mitigate the weaknesses in your own work? Yeah, these are enormous questions um, and I don't want to overgeneralize. So first, I should probably just say that there are quite a few misconceptions about what cognitive science even is. And this is some of these misconceptions are um, uh, reinforced by media representations of psychology or cogn uh, cognition and usually many people just assume it has to do with the brain and fMRI. And I actually don't work on uh, neuroscience or the brain or fMRI or neurology, which my own colleagues and my friends and mentors, just many of them have assumed that, oh, you just work on the brain. Um, but cognitive science itself is just a umbrella term for very multidisciplinary, uh, very, um, different approaches and this can be psychological like psychology which is different from neuroscience so neuroscience is focused on the physical brain um, and then education linguistics computer science philosophy anthropology so this is all under the umbrella of cognitive science and then so i distinguish differentiated neuroscience from psychology and psychology is its own giant discipline and that has many different fields within it. So it has developmental psychology, social psychology, education psychology, and cognitive psychology is just one. And there's, a, of course, there's a lot of overlap and people move between different levels of analysis, uh, but cognitive psychology is, is distinct um, from social psychology um, and theory of mind, which many people just equate with what cognitive studies is, is actually just one small subtopic within developmental psychology. So just even know, like one huge barrier <laughs> is even know, like having a sense of how enormous these areas and sprawling these areas are. And so just knowing that, oh, I don't care about neuroscience doesn't mean that caught like findings from cognition or education would not be actually enormously interesting <laughs> for you. Um, and this has to do with the disciplinary history of psychology itself. So we often talk about the cognitive turn or the cognitive revolution. And this was in the fifties and sixties. And this actually marked a reorientation toward the mind so we usually think of that as like, oh, it's very computational or artificial intelligence. And we associate that with like what we humanists are not interested in. But actually this was the moment when psychologists were allowed again to think about mental processes like perception or language or memory, emotion, learning. And these are very humanistic topics that have a long humanistic history. Um, so I would say that some differences between psychological approaches and literary critical approaches is, is that psychologists, they definitely recognize individual differences. So they know that we don't all have that, like context is very important to everyone's different, they know this, but they value working at a level of analysis that allow, so a certain level of abs abstraction that allows them to make predictions and probabilistic uh, claims. Whereas literary critics, we like, we value uniqueness. So it's valuable for us not just to attend to this one specific essay or short story, but this one passage inside this short story or this one phrase or word. And we, we want to look at this word or phrase in context of another specific text or context. So we really value these ways of seeing at this very minute level. Um, and in Catherine Hales's uh, conversation with you, she mentioned how we also like to move from a, a small, these micro details to a very large 
general claim and often the difficulty is training undergraduates and grad students to make a giant claim <laughs> because it feels it feels odd or strange to do this um and in in the social sciences if you present data that says a influences b your audience will ask you a lot about well what's the effect size what's the size of this influence and they'll ask you like what's your evidence for this this cause causal relationship or what's the likelihood that you're right and they will try to help you think of a new experiment that will help you rule out other potential effects but and this contrasts with what literary critics are interested in, because when we make claims about influence, we don't hold each other to that standard. Like we aren't really interested in asking, you know, well, how likely do you think this is in terms of a percentage or a probability? And this suggests to me that what's valuable to us in a reading is how it enables us to perceive meaningful patterns or resonances or forms of order and this and a reading is giving us instructions for perceiving the text in a new way and this is also what we're doing in the classroom we're we're giving students tools to see a text as this very differentiated surface instead of like a just smooth story that they just read from beginning to end um and some things that i think i found that both the humanities and social sciences and sciences have in common are we're all humans. <laughs> and so we all are kind of responsive to some of the biases and rewards that kind of make our day-to-day -day practices fall short of um, the ideal of learning and discovery. Um, so, even though we all want our students to dwell in complexity and think about nuance and be, you know, be okay with grays and not have everything be black and white. It's very hard to publish a paper in any field if you just say, oh, it's like there's a lot of things going on and it's not all just one thing and it's very complicated and I don't want to come down and like make a very strong claim. So in all fields for all journals, a simple story, a counterintuitive story, is has a lot of rhetorical force. is very memorable. So, so in psychology, sometimes people will try to massage their data a little bit to make their their um, it's called p hacking to make things seem statistically more significant because you want a big amount of significance and the same same for us it's like how do you frame your dissertation you want to like say it has giant stakes for the planet or for you know all of humanity and so you want to ratchet up the stakes um at the same time we also want to be very efficient so often our desire to be efficient can get in the way of learning about new ideas so and this is in peer review this happens so if you've ever gotten a reader's report where the person just like nitpicked on one little thing and just dismissed the whole article or applied some framework that was familiar to them but didn't really under try to understand what you're trying to say and this happens in all fields as well and and so some eds eds education psychologists call this like overzealous transfer of your existing con so you have this existing concept and you're just going to label it um when when maybe you want to refrain from using your um existing concept and so sometimes it is really costly and inefficient to uh branch out into new ideas and so often there are a lot of pressures and rewards and there's a lot of scarcity in all of academia and so sometimes there are barriers i've seen in all all fields that lead to kind of challenges for pursuing new kinds of work or new approaches and i've been to conferences in other disciplines in, in a psych, uh, I've been to a psych conference and definitely the hierarchies and all of that behavior is the same. <laughs> so, so it just, so he, we're all just humans. Um, and so those are some of the commonalities as well.
That's lovely. I'd never, you know, we think about the differences of scale. We think about the emphasis on reproducibility versus in STEM versus singularity in our field um, or in the humanities. But I hadn't thought about the common goal of, of what you described as simple counterintuitive stories and the rhetorical, the shared rhetorical force of that. And I'm actually teaching an article writing practicum and that's exactly the, the gist, but I'd never thought of that as a point of crossover. So thank you for that. Um, so, you know, um, some people come to the crossover with a background in science and then acquire the humanistic training. I think that's the case for uh, Professor Catherine Hales started in STEM and then shifted over. Whereas another one of our uh, guests in this series, Kristen Oster, got a humanities PhD and then did a master's in public health. Um, so the audience is curious about how your own work has proceeded. Has it been mainly self-guided? Has there been a kind of autodidacticism, voracious autodidacticism? Have you um, had formal training or been part of communities? How, how did you go about navigating what you've just described as a dizzyingly complex field that passes under this very deceptive singular noun. Um, anything you could tell us about that? Sure. Um, so I, I think because I was unusually obsessed with <laughs> a particular set of questions very early um, uh, in my intellectual history, um, uh, I I definitely wanted to work with Elaine Scarry um, as a graduate student. And she, so I was really fortunate to have an advisor who herself was interested in mental imagery and phenomenology and imagination in the body. But she also has this incredible multidisciplinary way of approaching every question. So she herself is interested in like nuclear policy and legal scholarship and political philosophy. And the way that she would arrange a seminar would be, the readings would be, you know, Plato, Augustine, Aquinas, language philosophy, JJ Gibson. Um, so it would be all, you know, all of these different points of contact. Um, and then I also worked with Philip Fisher, who's similarly interested in questions of attention and perception and visual art. So both of them really modeled and encouraged this very capacious way of thinking that could be transhistorical, transnational, and you kind of get this training uh, where you feel like you could learn anything. <laughs> and I've talked to others of their student, like Nick Dames is one of their students as well. And he's like, yeah, I feel like I can teach myself anything. At the same time that the downside of that is uh, many of us have had to learn also how to professionalize and to be legible within a specific hiring field. And I had to learn that later as well. And I can talk more about that. Um, so I did have a lot of institutional support um, because Elaine uh, led this uh, seminar on cognitive theory and the arts for many years at the Harvard Humanities Center. And so a lot of people came through like Dan Schachter who works in memory. So actual cognitive psychologists, but also philosophers, linguists, literary scholars. Um, and I did this Mellon workshop led by Steve Coslin and Anne Harrington, who's a historian of science, um, and have had some fellowships at these interdisciplinary centers. So I've had, I've been fortunate to be in interdisciplinary contexts that just said, basically said to me, it's okay to do this work. And I felt like I had permission to do this, but I, it was still very inefficient. <laughs> for me to go down this path. And um, before this uh, event started, I was talking to Claudia and Yasmin about how there's many moments when I just felt like, oh, I had nothing or I can't explain my project. Or I don't know what I'm doing. And just like a lot of setbacks and going down the wrong path. Um, but at the same time, you, why are you doing this? It's because there's some burning question that you really want to find the answer to that you're not able to find um, within your own discipline. Um, and so I had a number of turning key turning points. So one key turning point was often when people begin to think about cognitive studies, they look at, uh, there's a little mini canon of books that are aimed at popular audiences. So like Damasio's 
um, book on Descartes' era. A lot of people start with that, but that's that's just kind of providing an overview of psychological research and what you want to do is look at the actual research yourself instead of real, like having this mediated relationship to the psych psychology. Another just major breakthrough I had was when I realized there was this whole section of books on reading and what happens when we read in the library of the education school and not the main library. <laughs> and so there was so much there that I could find. And it was like exactly what I wanted to find, but it was just physically not where I was, I had been looking. Um, and again, this is because of the silos and the way that edu like education research has not been um, part of literary studies. And then another breakthrough was when I reached out to this um, vision psychologist, and this was one of my kind of wrong turns, but then he didn't write back to me, but he had a grad student write back to me and she recommended this graduate level textbook on vision science. It's a really great textbook. Um, and then that's how I learned, oh, you can read graduate textbooks on, and I still do that. So I've just read a textbook on motivation, um, uh, or I've, I've read a textbook on social psychology. Um, and so that can kind of give you the lay of the land and to find out like, what's the subtopic that I really want to know in an efficient way. And then you can also use the Oxford handbooks. So you could just type Oxford Handbook of Social Cognition or Oxford Handbook of Attention. And they'll also give you these overviews that, to help you narrow down and they'll, they'll lay out the different debates. Um, and then you can also learn how to find the key, con like the, the big study, the big breakthrough in some topic by finding review papers. And so review papers are kind of these long reviews that are published in these kind of review paper journals where they'll just give a whole history, kind of like in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, someone will write just like the history of some particular topic. Some um, important psychologist will write about the psychology of explanation and then we'll have like all the major turning points in the history of that. And so you can find that by just reading any paper and looking at where they cite in their lit review, a review paper. And so that's how you can look at people's work cited to look at that, which is similar to what we do as literary critics. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things you mentioned is that part of your capacious um, uh, training and, and mentorship um, did, did raise some challenges of legibility for you of communicating to different audiences and and that's one question that the organizers and the audience have been particularly interested in um do you wish for your work to be equally accessible to to the various disciplines you engage or have you presented in various disciplinary contexts and and what was your experience of that um I, I've, I've certainly tried out a bit of Damasio now and again and had interesting experiences. Um, did you deliberately seek out readers in cognitive science or a particular subset to, to vet your work, you know, um, or did the press do so? You probably don't know who they were. Um, what kinds of reactions have you had? And, and um, a really, um, I think, central question is how... Um, we were talking about Barbara Hernstein Smith earlier and, and how do you, one of the things she warns about for interdisciplinary work is um, without formal training in another discipline, how do we go about vetting um, competing theories, competing accounts, especially in fields that are really embryonic by even the most formidable practitioner's own accounts. So um, uh, one instance of this that I was wondering about in reading your book was, um, you know, um, the emphasis on vividness um, suggests a kind of picture theory of representation that feels very familiar to me and no doubt to you as 18th, 19th centuryists. But as you mentioned, you know, you mentioned computational theories of mind, which treat, which treat re cognitive representation as far more a syntactic thing, not a visual, not a picture based thing. So how do you go about adjudicating those, those difficult debates that are still going on? Um, and um, how do you make yourself legible? So those are kind of twinned questions you, you may want to, to take one over the other. Great. 
Thanks, Jasmine. Um, so one easy answer that I have is I don't think of psychologists as my audience. Um, and one of the reasons why is they don't often have background knowledge. So background knowledge is very important in comprehension <laughs> and they don't, they haven't read my primary texts. Um, and they also don't know novel theory or narrative theory. Uh, so my interventions really have no stakes for them. They're not interested. I've presented at the Society for Text and Discourse and they, they were really sweet and patient and just sat through my <laughs> talk, but it wasn't interesting for them because I had no data. And that was like very anomalous for them because what they would want to do is wait, like look at my data, weigh in on my experimental design, look at how I analyze my data. And so I'm just kind of, I get to be a theorist when I'm with them because I get to pick and choose and put to and synthesize a lot of the like little questions that they're all spending a long time focused on. And I get to kind of think more capaciously about what they're thinking about as well. And so I'm very interested still in talking to uh, humanists about literary and aesthetic experience. And so when I first started presenting my work as a grad student, I felt this, I felt a need to provide a lot of meta commentary about like, why is my approach legitimate? And why should we be interested in uh, psychology? And why is, why is this okay to do? And over time, I've just realized that the most effective way to gain acceptance for your method, if it's an unconventional method, is just to let your work speak for itself. So if you're able to pose a question that is interesting to literary critics, has value for them, has stakes, that becomes the justification for your method. If you can you know, illumin do a reading using these concepts, then you don't need to ask permission first to do your, just do it. And then they will find it useful. Um, and I actually think that is maybe, we're having a lot of method debates right now. And if people who are proponents of a certain kind of approach just did their approach, I think they would, you know, not rile people up about what approach people are or are allowed, are not allowed to do. Um, so certainly over, so one tip that I have is try to present at the same conference a lot of times because over the years, audiences who were resistant to my work because it was unfamiliar have become familiar with a lot of my concepts. So some people will be like, oh, I've been to a lot of your talks and I know these concepts now. And so then they're they're enthusiastic because this is also a very old concept, psychological concept that mere exposure to something can make you feel okay about it. <laughs> so just familiarity versus unfamiliarity um, is, a, is a barrier. Um, but still, of course, there are people who are unfamiliar and I'm always from time to time reminded that uh, my approach is on the margins. And But the, uh, the objections are often pretty consistent. And sometimes I commiserate with like Lisa Sunshine or other um, cognitive people about this, you know, how it's always the same. It's been the same objections for 20 years. Um, so A, why am I taking, I'm taking attention away from interpretation. So I'm taking attention away from what 98% of other critics are already doing, but then because this talk isn't what that is, it's doing something else, then I'm, I'm taking away attention from something that's important. Um, or it's so obvious and banal and like this is common sense. So why do we need psychology to, to confirm what is obvious? And Lisa Ruddick, um, at the University of Chicago had this piece in The Point a few years ago where she says, when common sense has been marginalized <laughs> by the discipline, then actually maybe that's why people are reaching for the sciences to recover. Because we're it's like, yes, you know, it, you say it's obvious, but then when I want to take it seriously, you don't actually want to go down that path. Um, and this this again, I think, has a lot to do with an aversion to anything that's scientistic um, because 
there are people who are very interested in psychological questions, but they would tend to reach for psychoanalysis or phenomenology because that, that mode of discourse feels very familiar to us. Um, so things that are unfamiliar, things that are effortful to learn, things that feel uh, disfluent in like psychological terms, they feel bad and they're not rewarding. So people just don't want to even look into it. Um, and then research on learning shows we turn, we tend to represent new ideas in terms of our existing frameworks. Um, so there's a children's picture book where that's called Fish is Fish, where a bird is describing to a fish what life is like, or it, no, a frog is describing to a fish what life is like above outside of the water. And then the fish is picturing all these fish with wings and beaks and fish with legs. So we just use our existing framework to think about another discipline. And so sometimes critics are very overzealous or quick to dismiss a psychological idea because they assume that the psychologist is trying to say, oh, all thinking is like this or every, cause they're trying to make a totalizing claim where psychologists just implicitly know that they're just kind of adding one little piece to the puzzle and they're not trying to make a giant claim that is universal. Um, there's also in-group and out-group resistance. So I've been sometimes frustrated to realize how people who are supposed to be committed to learning and open to new ideas and exchange of ideas are actually not committed to <laughs> new ideas and how can this be and this often is if you're if there's if the new idea is kind of maybe threatening your your group identity then you will be resistant to it even if your group identity is uh, is defined by being open to new ideas. Um, so as for the question of how to decide between diff competing scientific theories. So, so this is actually, for me, much easier than uh, one might think. And this is because there are so many basic concepts from like the 70s or even earlier that are really fundamental and have been replicated a lot of times. So like the, the, the familiar, the mere exposure effect. So the familiarity that's from the sixties. And it was even um, in the 19th century, there was a thought, someone had a thought about that. And so that's been pretty established. So it's not, I'm not using like something, oh, found in 2018 and it, maybe it's not gonna be replicated. So a lot of these concepts are so fundamental that um, there, for example, another one would be like our memory span is pretty limited, which is why telephone numbers are seven digits. And so we can kind of only remember seven things in working memory at the same time. And you can chunk bigger things together into seven things, but you, it's really hard to go beyond that memory span. And that's been pretty, um, uh, well replicated. Um, so as for, for example, the picture theory, so mental imagery and this question. So here's an instance where, and I, I can say more about this um, later, you have to ask yourself how, how much do, do you need to solve that debate for what you're trying to do? So the problem, the question of it, are mental images ultimately computational at bottom or do they have an embodied component? Probably there's like a dual process for, but like it probably is a little like sometimes abstract thought is, is useful and we have a capacity for abstract thought, but some things are very embodied. Um, so there can be middle ground, but also the question is if you're thinking about mental imagery when you're reading, you have a phenomenological experience of imagery. So it kind of doesn't matter if the underlying mechanism behind that mental imagery is computational or not because you're having that experience. So for example, sometimes I would go down and 
a rabbit hole that has to do with um, like the neuroscience behind something. But the neuroscience actually the effects of those processes are not conscious. Like I don't have access to that. So that's actually not something that a literary critic could really introspect about. Um, it's not something that a reader would be able to monitor because it's happening so quickly, it's like nanoseconds. So that is not really the realm that is relevant for a like my close analysis of a passage or a textual detail. I don't need to, it's actually, it would be misleading to give a neuroscientific explanation for that because my, my introspection can only be about what I'm conscious of. And actually just further backstory on the debate about our, our images computational or embodied. So there's also ind individual differences drive these divisions. Um, so Polition, who is a proponent of the computational theory, he doesn't experience mental imagery. Uh, this is what Steve Coslin told me, um, and Steve Coslin is a big proponent of mental imagery. So sometimes individual differences of the researchers are drawn to particular theories because of their own um, their own individual differences. That's absolutely wonderful. Uh, so much for the presumed objectivity of the scientific side of things. Um, thank you very much. I'm conscious that um, 45 minutes are roughly up. So I'm going to pass it over to the to the organizers to moderate a Q&A. Um, and uh, you've certainly said a lot about tips that, you know, advice to students interested in pursuing interdisciplinary work. And I think they may call on you for more. Um, but uh, I'll pass it over to Claudia now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to both of you. That was, there's I have so many questions that, that <laughs> it was so interesting. Um, and thank you so much for offering all of that. And thank you to Yasmin as well for acting as the interlocutor here. Um, just to remind people, you can shoot questions in the chat. Um, if you'd rather just type them up and one of um, our moderators or myself or Arno, I believe Kristen is here now, um, can read them out. Um, or you can just stick up a digital hand or stick up a physical hand and we'll just keep an eye on the, on the tiles on the screen and see who has, has a question. Um, we've actually already got one in the chat. Um, Arno, do you want to handle the chat questions and I'll keep an eye on the physical questions? I'm happy to. I, I think I may not be seeing the question you're asking about. Okay, I'll, I'll go for it then. Um, yeah. so this is from Anna. Um, so she asks, in the sciences, there are ethical implications behind fudging the statistical analysis, what you mentioned as p-hacking. And many argue this has led to an epidemic of bad science. Are there similar similar ethical implications in literary analysis in taking a small claim and blowing it out of proportion? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a very uh, timely question because I think that gets to the heart of the critique, post-critique um, debate and that's a very vehement debate right now. And I think that this is a, understand like getting clarity on what um literary text can and cannot do to readers um could help us be more precise about the political effects of what we're doing um so for example um on the realist floor plan jameson talks about how this short story from flaubert is programming the reading body, which is a bit like a very serious claim, right? So this detail, the floor of this character's house is uneven, and then the reader's body is being programmed in this difference, this inequality or unevenness of the floor. Um, and so this might have a political effect. And this actually goes back to um, Matthew Arnold's claim in the 19th century about how students are, will be insensibly influenced by uh, the poetry that they learn by heart. So just learn a lot of poetry and this will insensibly influence you. And this is why we literary study has large scale social effects. Uh, but how does this influence actually work? Um, because as we know in our own teaching, often students have very little recollection of what they've read and they've paid very little attention. Like a lot of the details do not seem to have stuck. 
um, and is actually a lot of work right now on um, uh, textbook design has to do with the difficulty of belief change. So how can we make climate science stick and change beliefs? And it's actually very hard to do that. So what would that mean for how we think about how a text influences or shapes an audience over time in certain ways? And one um, key distinction in learning um, psychology is that between the expert and the novice. So often an expert sees things in ways that a novice can't. So for example, like expert chess players will see a chess board and see all the moves and the strategy going on. And the novice just doesn't, it's not meaningful to a novice and the same for an expert. So if you have to be an expert in order to perceive the ways in which a text is disciplining you, then maybe the novice is not being disciplined because they don't see it. <laughs> so that also kind of plays a role in what our, our longstanding beliefs about what we're doing and the politics of what we're doing and how much influence literary text or literary criticism actually has on society. Thanks, that was great. Um, Trish, you've got a question? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you, um, Elaine, for that talk. That was just fascinating. Um, and there's lots of things that I could ask about. Um, but kind of, I guess, following on in some ways from what you were just discussing, um, I'm curious about the, the sort of pedagogical um, aspect of your, your current work. And um, I just wonder if you could elaborate a bit more um, on sort of how you envision bringing, you know, what we do um, in this profession into sort of, I guess, better alignment with um, educational theory or, or um, yeah, the kind of silo problem that you were talking about earlier. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, sort of your reflections on that in your current work. And then um, also, you know, if you have any sort of vision for like what ideal kind of institutional changes might help? I know that's kind of a big question, but um, yeah, I'm just really interested in hearing more about that. Yeah, I think, I mean, it just feels like there's so much low hanging fruit in education psychology um, in terms of how we can start really thinking about what we're doing as critics. And, and this actually is helpful because it can help us clarify and articulate what we actually are already doing. So for example, um, Dan Schwartz, who's the Dean of the Stanford School of Education has um, published some work with John Bransford, who's a just giant in the field of cognitive psychology and education psychology um, about how there's this category. So knowing there's no how and no, uh, so there's knowing that so these two distinctions that Jonathan Kramnik has recently discussed about like we have knowledge, like fa knowledge of facts and then skill based knowledge, but they introduce this concept of knowing with. So how we can use our background knowledge to see a problem in a different way. And this seems very much in line with what we are trying to help equip students to do and, a, and they mention a lot of like humanistic type experiences. So for example, if you learn a foreign language, suddenly English becomes differentiated in ways that it never was before. Or if you, or if you study abroad, suddenly your life at home becomes differentiated in ways that it never was before. And so the more differentiation you have, the more you can bring that to a novel situation and you know, think about how you might go about solving that problem. So you would be knowing with um, this vast, rich body of background knowledge. Um, and so that would, that would help you see it and interpret it in a different way. And so that seems very much in line with what humanities, uh, uh, the humanities is trying to do at the same time Often a big problem in teaching and learning is that things are very context specific. 
So something that is happening and successful in the classroom is not going to happen. Like students are not going to know that they should re they should apply some concept that they learned in the classroom to this novel context because it looks very different. So then they recommend Schwartz and Bransford recommend we need to have some meta <laughs> discussion so that it's me. So it's like what hat so we're being we're having an ethical response to this character. But what happens when you're not in a classroom situation where your reward, the reward system is empathizing with the character and paying attention to the text, but the reward system is there's something at, that comes at a cost to you to align yourself with some other person. So we can think about like the difference between a classroom context or a text context and a real world situation, which is interactive and maybe you are self-conscious about what this means for you. Um, so some kind of more, more meta discussions and reflections on what we're doing and what kinds of concepts students are, are, are learning. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, does anybody else has, has a question they want right now? Or are we still cogitating? We're still cogitating. In that case, I will ask a question. Um, so uh, going back to a bit more of the sort of theoretical problems with interdisciplinary work, um, one of the things I really have a hard time with, and you've spoken a little bit about this all the way across your talk, um, but I'd like to hear maybe a little bit more about it is that this this real collision between um, the more universal claims that scientists make or that we perceive them to be making um, versus an English department or humanities department's value for contingency and specificity and context. And I'm wondering, you know, your book really, um, I don't want to say it doesn't worry about it, but as you say, it's, it's looking at a more universal experience of reading um, in terms of making claims about how a lot of readers can respond to Tolstoy in a certain way. A lot of readers can respond to Mr. Collins and Pride and Prejudice in a certain way. Um, and looking at those commonalities. And I'm wondering to what extent did you get resistance to those kinds of claims? Um, I know I do already. <laughs> um, even if you know, like, and I, I really appreciate your, your articulation of how, why this is important in terms of taking seriously the kinds of more mundane reading practices or more everyday reading practices that non-specialist readers have. Um, and that's very appealing to me, but it's also really kind of runs up a lot against what our discipline sort of encourages on an academic level. So I guess I'm curious just to hear more about that experience of doing that kind of work and what resistance you got um, and how you sort of dealt with it. Yeah, I think a lot of, so uh, Schwar Bransford and Schwartz also have a paper on this overzealous transfer and I think a lot of this resistance actually has a little bit of a reductive approach to context and what it means to historicize because often when I was first starting out um, some people would say oh you should it's if you're if you're working with 19th century texts then it's important for you to just focus on 19th century ideas about the mind as if everything has to be like coherent in this in this way and what i think is limiting about the way we think about periodization and con historical context is that some things are very local and context so for example Victorian readers would know a lot more about the Bible than contemporary readers, but some things are not like localized in that way. So embodiment, um, the way that you can learn about a character, a literary character. So those processes are not just confined to uh, the Victorian period. So there are just different scales of context. So there are some contexts that are extremely low, like, oh, only in like, we're, I just was teaching about aestheticism. So this is a very, you know, localized part of the 19th century. But then there could also be issues of perception and consciousness that have a longer span. 
of time before they change. Um, and so, so we can just have a more flexible idea of what the appropriate context is. And not every question is going to have um, a, a very like a broad span of time. And not every question is gonna just need to be all nested within the same few decades. I guess, thanks for that. I have a, I have a short follow-up question, which is, um, do you ever get the question, um, well, I, the cognitive science today might well be applicable to people in the 19th century. Why the 19th century then? Why not write a book about modernism? Why not write a book about the 18th century? Why not write a book about all of them together? What is it, what is particularly appealing about the 19th century in terms of applying this kind of more modern um, research in psychology? Mm -hmm. um, I would say, this is- I'm basically it's, asking you to answer my question. That very I want similar to get. question, the question <laughs> that I find. Um, so I think that it could just be, this is unique to my and Claudia's interests. Um, uh, if you're thinking about certain readerly effects, then different periods are very like are going to lean on those effects. And the 19th century novel is a moment in the history of the novel where realism and uh, very similar, very similar effects um, are something that writers are interested in producing. Whereas in the 18th century and in modernism, there is a kind of self consciousness um, that wants to disrupt those effects. Um, so that's the answer that I would give. Great, and I agree. So that's stuff. Um, I will, I will, I will, if we get a chance to talk one and all, I will press you more on that, but we better, does anybody else have questions they would like to jump in on? And just remind, you can shoot them in the chat if you'd rather not um, talk on video. I know. I, I'm just going to take the opportunity the same way Claudia did to, to uh, just po pose the questions that are deepest on my mind. And it goes back to your work on, on absorption, Dr. O. Young, which is such a kind of common phenomenon in, in literature. But I think I'm, I'm conscious that we have some folks coming in from the, the more kind of masters of fine arts and visual arts. We have folks coming in from library services that work with more kind of programming uh, and tech features sometimes. And the experience of absorption is one that happens in those domains just as much, right? And we, so we, it's those moments where we realize there's an aesthetic thrill to just about every single discipline. And so I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those moments where suddenly maybe as you're writing, you're like, oh my gosh, this is universally applicable to every single discipline ever. I should totally write about this. And then that moment, you know, you, you mentioned that in some ways you don't feel an obligation to write to the psychologists necessarily, but are there moments in your own work and if so, what kind of discipline do you use to hold yourself back where you want to say, ah, I really wish I could from the perspective of English uh, inform some of what's going on across these other bridges. Uh, in some ways, you know, the, the, what Jonathan Kramnik and others have written about, but also everybody who's ever responded to E.O. Wilson's notion of consilience, whereby biology and physics can explain every single discipline. <laughs> we, we, we need to do quantum literature or something like that. Um, their tendency is to feels though everything that they define and discover about the laws of the universe are applicable to the humanities in some, in some respect. And people have pushed back and said that there's fallacies involved in that, of course. But there's also moments I think where it's understandable from the perspective of English, whether it's from a cognitive approach or even just a hermeneutic approach about interpretation, where it feels though, yes, our, our insights are valid for other disciplines. They want to, or they kind of yearn to go in that other direction. And so I've just been wondering if for you, that moment, perhaps that light bulb moment where you have an insight that you think could be applicable to other disciplines, whether it's health and medicine, where the world of compassion is really important, or the visual and creative arts, where absorption is such a kind of tangible goal sometimes, uh, and sometimes hard to reach. How do you stop yourself in those moments um, and just say, at the end of the day, I'm a literary critic, I'm going to write for my literary audience. Is it an aesthetic exercise of saying, nope, I'm not doing that? Is it a, is it a pleasure to say, oh, this is really fun, but you know, I need to focus on what I'm doing and this is enjoyable. Um, what, is, what is that actually like um, for you in those moments? Um, so I think I, one of the, so there's two answers. So for example, the, the liter psychology of absorption is widely applicable and the person who has 
popularized those ideas is Mihai Csikszent Mihai, who writes about flow. Mm -hmm. So flow states are something that many different fields and podcasters have mm -hmm. have recognized. And so this is something that many scholars or any just anyone interested in this topic of absor attentional absorption have latched on to um, this concept of flow. Uh, so then you can see how someone can just put out this idea about flow and give some examples of different instances of flow and then let other people find it and use it for their own purposes. I think for me, in terms of restraining myself, it's not so much restraining myself because I need to hold myself back. It's recognizing the practicalities of how disciplines work and how publication work. So you can't actually, you can actually a chapter or an article only has space for a very focused and delimited argument. So the more you are ranging all around, it's actually very hard to read. So often, the, and this is actually one of the limitations of a lot of existing um, approaches to cognitive literary studies from coming from cognitive narratology. So a lot of these, you open up these books and it's just like every, the examples are all from all kinds of uh, narratives, all kinds of genres, and they just are trying to talk about everything in a very universal way. And actually, in terms of being a learner, it's very hard to learn from those th that very general uh, universalized approach, because in order to learn something, you need to kind of grab onto very like a specific text, a specific set, set of examples, and then go really deep on that so that the your reader can understand and then enough to learn how to apply it to something else. So it's more about the practicalities of how you're writing to teach someone. And so it's more like what is effective at um, teaching someone to understand what you're trying to say. And actually it's very, so when you share your, and I recommend sharing your work, you always, one always finds that you're hoping that people will help you get to the next step, but what turns out to be the case is often you have not clarified, like you've not clearly explained um, something that you already have figured out. Mm. Uh, so this is really about like a writing problem. Yeah, that makes a ton. That makes a ton of sense. Um, and and we've talked at different stages throughout this series about the ways in which the different incentives and in publication being a big one create limitations for a sense of one scholar being able to dip into the other pool. And you're and you're, you know, the, the way you describe the experience with um, kind of attending psychology conferences or, or speaking before psychologists and and them asking you, well, what are your methodologies or you know, <laughs> what is your what is your evidence maps on even across our disciplines. I, I present at medical humanities conferences regularly as you recommended, you know, because I know that it's going to take a while for Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen to be a valid instance of, of medical knowledge um, in any way, uh, even if it is all about addictions and, and cognitive problems like that too. So I totally sympathize. My follow-up question though was going to be if you could go back on once you've achieved maybe an interdisciplinary research question and developed it and expanded it, you said sometimes it's difficult to achieve that legibility back to your core audience in English and you needed some training in that. What did that look like? Um, so that, yeah, this is the, the mentoring, the mentoring question that we didn't get to. Um, so I would say that uh, in terms of the hiring, uh, practices or, um, you know, getting fellowships or opportunities so that you can continue to do the interdisciplinary work that you do. Um, uh, I would recommend that you do want to make yourself legible to a field because that's how <laughs> committee, like search committees work. They think about filling it. So there is this kind of tension between being encouraged to and wanting to do, you know, break boundaries and try to introduce new methodologies. At the same time, the 
institutionalized hiring practices are very conservative. Um, so I basically had to make, after not really needing to look like a Victorianist for much of my um, graduate training, I had to look like a Victorianist, um, even though my questions and interests kind of transcend Victorian studies, um, I did have to do that. Um, Would you say that was a good or a bad or a, like what, were there any affects or values associated with that? <laughs> I think my interest, like I, by disposition, I'm always going to be interested in big questions. Um, and that's uh, something that I also didn't get to speak about, which may be important for anyone who's interested in this kind of cross-disciplinary work is um, I have very close friends who are psychologists now um, at the University of Minnesota and are ones at McAllister, one just moved to Georgia Tech. Um, and we're, and so they're psychologists and I always run things by them and I learn from them and they help me. Um, but they also are people in their own field who happen to be interested in big questions. <laughs> So it seems like by disposition, there can be people who are at the margins of def like different disciplines. And to just go back to this disciplinary question, every discipline has very prototypical areas of research and then topics that are kind of more on the margins or interdisciplinary. So even in physics, there's mainstream high energy physics or condensed matter physics. And then biophysics is on the margins or people working on chemistry that have physics applications are in the margins. And so this is what I think about my relationship to literary studies where there's people very interested in questions of interpretation and his literary history and the history of ideas. And I'm always gonna be interested in aesthetic experience and perception and technique, and that's going to be always on the margins, and that's on the margins of every uh, uh, art form. So in music and musicology or art history. Um, so I think it's also just knowing what kind of person you are and being okay with that. <laughs> um, yeah. That's supremely helpful. Yeah, thank you. I wonder whether I could ask a question. I can't do raise hand, I think, because I'm set up as a co-host. So I don't want to I don't want to prevent anyone else from. Uh, would this be a good moment, Claudia? Yeah. Okay. Well, just just what you're saying, um, Elaine, brings about one of the questions that I that I didn't get to. Um, I'd love to invite you to speak a little bit more about the current work. The unilateral absorption, um, you know, attending to a performance, but when you're not being attended to in return and the ways this might prove valuable for thinking about interpersonal relations outside of the aesthetic realm. But you mentioned that part of what you're interested in right now is the rationale for literary study. And, and I completely share that. And I'm wondering what you think about you know, the argument on the one hand for getting rid of the silos and having physical and intellectual um, cross-pollination, spaces of cross-pollination. And then the argument by, you know, Jonathan Kramnik most, most visibly for retaining the silos because of the, and, and for an, what he, you know, he calls an, an epistemological pluralism, um, a, a variety of ways of knowing our human experience that are that should not be ranked horizontally, but but uh, vertically, but matter horiz you know kind of horizontal equ equal right. I wondered um, if you could say a little bit more about the interest in aesthetic experience, the humanities, and literary study in particular, and whether and how you feel about the silos issue. Do you find yourself maybe moving towards a an from an interdisciplinary vantage, a defense of the humanities, or is that a misconstrual on my part? Yeah, I think uh, maybe ironically, my cross-disciplinary interest is always in trying to understand the, like what is distinctive about the arts. Um, and, but the, the problem that I've run into is interpretive tools don't help like aren't the tools that I need to understand what is distinctive about experiencing the arts or creating the arts. 
And so that's why I'm going to these other um, other disciplines um, and literatures. I would say though, I think the longer I've been in my discipline, I'm just struck more and more by how everybody's interests and questions are a little bit different. And so I think what happens is when you have, when you, even if we were to remove the silos, in order to converge on really precise um, meaning, like substantive work, you really do have to narrow down. So this goes back to Arnaud's question. In order to, like, you really have to be very clear and focus on what you are trying to answer and what you aren't trying to answer and what you need to do to answer this very specific question. Um, so for example, I gave a talk to our chemical engineering department, which is a very high powered department and they have this lecture series on aesthetics. And I kicked off the lecture series and tried to teach them about defamiliarization. And we talked about a musical piece by Aaron Copeland and this poem, this sonnet about spring by Dave Smith. And what was interesting about the Q&A was they had, had, they had all these burning questions about art and aesthetics, but they had had so little opportunity to think about these questions that they were all enormous questions that could not possibly, like one person cannot possibly, like this, this question is tied up with a lot of different other questions. Um, and assumptions, and we would need to unpack that for 20 minutes. So this different, this differentiation, the conceptual differentiation that I was mentioning is part of what I think is actually really important for being precise and careful. But then what happens is then you are only able to be really specific. <laughs> And then you can't answer a bunch of questions because if you are trying to do that, then maybe everything is kind of muddied and conflated and you need to keep, you need to disambiguate um, a lot of these very similar concepts in order to really get at the heart of what you're doing. So I think precision is what I really value and also something that guides my work. Um, so I think it, it kind of doesn't matter to me whether we're siloed or not. I'm still going to do my work, but I still am going to do it in a precise way. And I think that's the only way that work can be done well. So just like very clear about what you are and are not trying to do. Thank you so much. We probably have time for one more question if anybody else wants to jump in. In that case, um, I think we can probably wrap up. Um, we don't need to stretch to 2.30 if we don't need to. Everybody's busy. Um, so I just wanted to, first of all, just thank Professor Ouyang for a really, really excellent session. Um, I was really excited to hear everything she has to say and also to Yasmin as well for um, interlocuting here today. It was a really interesting conversation. Um, I also wanna just thank a few other people. Uh, first of all, Alyssa, who is our um, grad admin here in the English department, who's been doing so much help behind the scenes in this series and has handled so many things that I wouldn't even begin to know how to deal with. <laughs> um, so a huge thank you to Alyssa for everything she's been doing for the past several months on this series. It's turned out great. And I'm really, really grateful for all of her help. Um, and I also just wanted to thank Arno and Kristen. Who, Kristen is here, hopefully having passed her dissertation, Prospectus Defense. <laughs> Congratulations to Kristen. Um, and so I just wanted to thank both Arno and Kristen as well um, for all their help over the past several months. Um, and I've really appreciated it. And um, I think it's turned out to be a great series. So thank you to all of you who have uh, for coming today and for coming to previous sessions, if you have uh, attended previous sessions. And tune in for future uh, announcements on Cyborg. We're hopefully going to continue next semester. So um, you'll hear about that when it happens. And thank you to everyone and uh, have a good rest of your week. Thanks. And if anyone wants to follow up, just feel free to email me and I can help you find those connections that you are looking for. So just feel free to reach out. Thanks.